Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. All right, let's go to the line. We'll talk uh, with uh, the outstanding John Crispin from ESPN. Sir, welcome. Great to have you with us. Hey, my my pleasure, man. I'm happy to join you. What a great season. Glad you got to enjoy another good one with the boys. Um, it, you know what, Steve? You know what it reminded Joe and I of? It, it actually reminded us for the first time, because we live with the disappointment in the fact that we did play in a Final Four. It reminded us how special it was to get to a Sweet 16, because I thought the team this year was phenomenal. Yeah, well, you know what? I mean, it, it was interesting, the parallels. And I had texted Pat Kraft this the day after they lost to Rutgers. And I pointed out how your team on senior day, you know, it didn't go well against Ohio State, then then hit the Big Ten tournament, beat Michigan, beat Michigan State, got yep. to the tournament, got to the Sweet 16. The parallels were amazing with an older team. Yep. And, you know, and that's even though you were a sophomore at the time. Joe yeah, but senior. you know, I came in with my brother as a junior in high school. I think that was yeah. what was different. Right. Um, and I was always older because I grew up playing. I mean, shoot, I was an eighth, ninth grader in, in, back in Pittman, sure. New Jersey, working out with Matt Maloney and Tim Legler. Like, I yeah. learned how to play differently. I learned the maturity yeah. in the game differently. So we were. We were a very experienced group. In a way, yep. I almost felt like a senior with them uh, because of yeah. how well I knew them. And I think the remarkable thing was that it's not that these guys all grew up together at Penn State. You know, they, they were a lot of transfers and transplants, and they figured sure. it out, and ultimately that was the, the genius in it. Yeah, I mean, no question. So they, the last six years, and I'm going to get to Micah in a moment, the last six years, Penn State has had three 21 seasons. They've won an NIT, would have been in the tournament in 20, made the second round in 23. Does this tell us what Penn State basketball can be? Uh, I mean, to a degree, yes. But, I mean, is, is this is this replicable next year? Good question. Hard to tell. I think that's the challenge, and that's ultimately been the challenge for Penn State. We've shown that, that we can put together good teams. Um, and, yes, it could be done, but it has to be done – once this job is not a stepping stone, and this is not a, that's not yeah. a knock in any way. That's a knock in mm-hmm. any way, anything on the history of the program. Um, so many people, I've heard people talk about resources. Look, it's not about resources. It's about history. Uh, it's actually something Joe and I just got done having this conversation in, on our podcast, and you'll have to listen to it because you know how Joe is and you know where Joe stands on that job. But it's really mm-hmm. about clarifying purpose and clarifying the reality uh, of the challenges. And it's, it's not about NIL. It's not about the resources in terms of the money. It's the reality surrounding the program, the lack of history, mm-hmm. uh, and, and the broken narrative that is, well, it's Penn State every now and then. They're, they're always competitive, which mm-hmm. means that we lose well. And I think that's it's one of those things where this could be or could have been in so many ways. Hopefully it could be and not could have been. But... Hopefully it could be the beginning of something new that becomes more long-term. I mean, that's always been our hope for the program. I mean, our hope for the program when, when I was there was that this is this is not it. There's got to be sure, more. no question. Yep. Never felt that that was going to be the case. It's probably why I left. Uh, and ultimately what I learned when I left was how special Penn State really was. And I tell people all the time, it, to a degree, I probably appreciate Penn State more than anybody that stayed there four or five or even Dan Earl six years because I left it, <laughs> and I didn't have it, and I had dreams about returning, and I missed my family. I missed the community. I missed all the things that I didn't realize mattered so much, and I think if you don't get those things, then it's not it's not really going to be a sustainable thing. I think those things are what makes right. the place so special. Well, if anybody knows the history of it, I guess I I, I would qualify as Exhibit A, so... Yes, <laughs> been, yep. Yeah, been, you know it. I've been a... F- 41 season witness <laughs> for better or for worse uh, and you bought you made yeah. it all sound positive too. Yeah. <laughs> there's an art to that i'll get to it yeah. probably later in my career I'll, I'll explain what the art of it is uh but now they've got this this will be end up being the fourth coach in 29 months yeah because of all the circumstances that have played out without using names what kind of person do you think can succeed here? Well, first off, it's got to be someone that, that wants to make it better for the next guy and not use this as the next job to get the next job, right? And 
right now that's what it is and that's the reality because the more time you spend there with that mentality the more you realize your limitations and the more you lean on your limitations as, as a crutch to explain your struggles We've seen that happen over the years. We, you, you know that's happened over the years, whether it's been the mm-hmm. scheduling, the calls you get. It becomes, in a way, a crutch. And I think yeah. you can't have that if you want to build a sustainably successful program at Penn State. You can't have that if you want to change the mentality of the fan base, change the mentality of people you recruit, which in so many ways changes, it change, is changing the narrative. Um, the narrative is something that is tied to the history, and something Joe and I talk about a lot. If you don't understand the history of the place or, or the program, then you'll never really make it better 10, 15, 20 years from now. So to me, this is a long-term hire. Whoever it's going to be, it's got to be a long-term hire. It's got to be someone that says, I, I don't really want to use this to get someplace else. I want to use this to make this program sustainable going forward. Otherwise, you do this again, and, and you, you have another, you know, go for two, three years, and they have a great year, and that coach gets another yeah. job and you're looking at five coaches over the last six years, that's not a good thing for the program. That means this is where you go to get the next job. And, and in no way is that a criticism of Micah Shrewsbury at all. He's a phenomenal basketball coach. I think mm-hmm. he can coach in the NBA. I think yeah. he gets basketball. I think he gets basketball players, and he maximizes the potential of his players. And he was always an Indiana guy. This is a great opportunity. This is a, a, an ACC that he can go win in right away and be mm-hmm. back into the, his Indiana roots. Um, so, so in no way is it a criticism of Michael Shrewsbury. He had a great season and he got great opportunities at a time when there were a lot of opportunities on the market. So mm-hmm. it, it's not a criticism as much as it's just pointing back to, once again, the reality and is how often do you want to go through this process and how many times do you go through this process only to realize that you're taking two steps forward and four steps back? Because that's what ends oh, up happening. Yeah. Have we changed the identity of the program? Answer, no. If outcome is tied to your identity, then you've got problems. And I, and I think that's the thing that, that Joe and I talk a lot about to say, like, hey, at some point it's got to be someone that doesn't want to leave. And you know who I keep coming back to, whether that's now or mm-hmm. eventually. Right, sure. You know, I think that's, that's where our conversations continue to come back to because otherwise it's just going to be the next job before the next job. Well, and that goes to the point before you came on the show. I did say, look, there will be – candidates both internally and externally I said if if I'm involved which I'm not yeah the one thing I want to know among comparable candidates is which one can you read feels that this job is the job well I can tell you one there's a guy that has 120 pages sure. written on the vision of Penn State basketball right uh, you know I mean I mean that's the thing it's like I you know I, I, I don't want to advocate um, although the more we talk about it, the more I realize it's something I would probably do with him. And mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where it's not a it's not a job; it's a responsibility. And I think that's what makes it special. So so if you ask someone, "What do you think of this opportunity?" and they say it's a great opportunity to build a program here, I would say then you're probably not the right guy. If you don't view this job as a responsibility to make mm-hmm. the program better for the next guy, then you're not the right person. Right. And the hope is that the next guy's 20 years down the road, because if you get longevity in this business, if you get longevity in the Big Ten, yeah. you win. That's just how it yeah. goes. And the real question is, Steve, something Joe and I talk about a lot with, with the program, because we say this about the Big Ten. We've seen the struggles in the Big Ten in the NCAA tournament. Well, the Big Ten is a simulation league. Joe says it's a copy, copycat league. Joe and I just say the same thing differently. That's why we argue. Um, I say that you have to assimilate in the conference to be able to win the conference. Why are you building a team to win the conference? Why not build a team to finish fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh every single year, have the opportunity to be different enough to make a run in the Big Ten tournament, maybe win a Big Ten tournament championship, and be different enough from from your Big Ten foes to be dangerous in the NCAA tournament? That's, That's what you should be building. This is a Penn State basketball. This is the ultimate underdog story. And if you don't relish that limitation, you don't relish that that in so many ways constraint on the game, then you're not playing into the real identity of the program, and you're not going to be able to maximize the real potential of the program. So I think that's a big part of it is you can't just be like everybody else. You've got to be different. Fourth through seventh gets you a bid. Yes, it does. Right. Yes, it does. Okay. But it doesn't and win your if, Big Ten title, and that's fine. Right. Regular season, but, at least. But fourth through seventh gets you into the tournament. 
yep. where if you have a different style, which Penn State was this year, yeah, you then unique. become a team. Okay, you then become a team. That everybody sits there and go, oh, how do we handle this? Because yep. now you're on a di- now you're on a different plateau, a different plane. Yes. And what if what if Penn State's the only team in the Big Ten that full court presses? And I mean presses. Putting right. a press out there and pressing are two different things. And we hear that a lot. Well, we press. I'm like, oh, really? So you stand there in your no. zone and you back up into no. another zone and you call that pressing? That's not hey. pressing. The only time Texas I see A&M, pressing is when a team's down 15 with five minutes left to play. <laughs> Texas, A&M, Texas A&M presses, and all they do is so that you have 22 in the shot clock when you cross half court. Yeah. Okay, that's the, okay, that's not a press. That's just taking time off the clock. No. You press to make people uncomfortable. You make you press to make the rhythm of the game the way you want it. You press to make the pace of the game you want it. You press so that you force a team to take quicker shots in transition that they're not comfortable with. And then you get the game played the way you want it. Look, revolutionary war tactics. I say this all the time. Joe and I are big on this. You, know, you look at Purdue. There's a reason why they lost. They, they're the Redcoats. And FDU didn't meet them on the battlefield. They, right. they, they meet them at the pass with far less and far smaller, mm-hmm. and they take a little bit out, and they make you question what you're even doing. And then they blow up a bridge, and, they, and then you question even further what we're doing. Like, are, Is this really going to allow us to win? You saw that on the faces of Purdue. Why was that? Why would that not work in the Big Ten enough to be an NCAA tournament team nearly every single year? I, I, yeah. I think it does, but here's the thing, Steve. If you're making $3 million a year, it doesn't work because yeah. your focus is on keeping your job. Yeah. But if you're focused on building this thing for the long haul and say, look, mm-hmm. you're going to love our identity, you're going to love how we mm-hmm. lose as much as we, you love how we win, that's something that's sustainable. And, and I think that's where you really got to take a different look at at this point. around. Look, if Micah Shrewsbury stays, stayed here for 10 years, maybe it's different. right? Yeah. Maybe it's different where you're going, all right, we're mm-hmm. inheriting a program in a great place. I, is it really in a great place right now, or did they finish the season well? It's, they mm-hmm. finished the season well. The coach is gone, who was a great coach. It's not that it's in a better place. Perception-wise, from a recency mm-hmm. bias, yes, it is. But how do you capitalize on that when the coach is gone? I think that's the thing. It's in, a, in a way, it's really back to the drawing board, and it better be a long-term plan. Well, just very quickly, one final comment. I mean, I know you'd have to go back to take a look at it, but John Wooden ran a 2-2-1 press. <laughs> that's a long yeah. time ago. Yep. <laughs> but, he, but he did, and they used it to score. Okay. John, always a pleasure. Appreciate your time very much, my friend. Headed over to MSG. Got M- uh, Michigan State and Kansas State yeah. tonight. Yeah, should, should be yeah fun. you got what? You got Westwood tonight. I'll tell you, Kansas State. Jerome Tame came in at two guys left, and all of a sudden he's got No Noel. He's got Keontae Johnson. He's got a heck of a he's team. Got dudes. He's yeah, got he's got dudes. dudes. He used the portal. He got him. Got dudes. He got he got smart dudes too. Yep. Hey. Yep. Should be fun. Should be a good night. Should be great. Thanks, John. Hey, my pleasure, Steve. Anytime.